Welcome again. Right now we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 34, the resurrection of the dead. Paul continues, he writes, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, neither has Christ been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Yes, we are also found false witnesses of God because we testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he didn't raise up, if it is so that the dead are not raised. For if the dead aren't raised, neither has Christ been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. How would it be that you're still in your sins if Jesus was not raised? When Jesus died on the cross, he died as the sinless, spotless lamb. And you see, a lot of Christians do not understand the whole concept of the lamb sacrifice. This is how it worked. If you are taken up in some sin, if you are caught up in some sin, if you are bound, if you are in slavery to some sin, and you just can't find repentance for it, because you know, in the scriptures, and God's word says, his eternal word says, mercy is found after repentance. First you have to repent and then you will find mercy. Let's say you can't repent from a certain sin. What you do then is you go and you find yourself a spotless lamb and you take it to the temple and you present it to the priest. And the priest would take that lamb and the priest would slaughter that lamb as you watch it. When you're watching that lamb, the whole idea is you identify with that lamb. You watch it being sacrificed. As its blood pours out, you say to yourself, there goes the life of my sin. You connect with that lamb prophetically. You connect with that lamb spiritually. So when that lamb dies, you say, my sin died. In the same way, when Jesus died on the cross, the whole idea is that you are supposed to look at that cross and you are to say exactly what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Not substitute, okay? It's not like, well, Jesus died so that I don't have to die. Well, Jesus paid the price. Well, yes, he paid the price, but he paid the price so that you can identify with him so that you could say, I am dead with him. And when Jesus rose from the dead, you are to connect with that. You are to connect by faith to that resurrection. And you are to say, as he rose from the dead, so I rise in a new life. I am born again, born of the Spirit of God. That's the way it works. So without the resurrection, you are still in your sins. You are still dead in your sins. With the resurrection, you can identify with that resurrection and you can say, just as Jesus rose from the dead, I rose to newness of life, a brand new life, a brand new person. I am a new creation in Jesus. Then they also who are fallen asleep in Christ, those Christians who have died, have perished. If we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. He became the first fruit of those who are asleep. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ, who belongs to him, Notice that not everybody belongs to Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus are truly few and far between. Don't forget, Jesus said most people, by far most people, are on the road to destruction. But very, very few people find that straight and narrow path that leads to life, that leads to heaven. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ, who belongs to Christ at his coming. Then the end comes when he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he will have abolished all rule and all authority and power. This means everybody in charge of the earth, every political power at that time will be abolished by Jesus. 
For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Of course, that implies that the political powers that be, when he comes back, will be his enemies. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he puts all things in subjection under his feet. And again, Paul quotes, of course, the so-called Old Testament, Psalm chapter 8, verse 6. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who subjected all things to him. When all things have been subjected to him, then the Son will also himself be subjected to him who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. Or else, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead aren't raised at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Why do we also stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If I fought with animals at Ephesus for human purposes, what does it profit me? Paul here is referring to humans as animals. If the dead are not raised, then let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13. Notice Paul always quotes the Old Testament to substantiate his doctrine. Don't be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. There's a good tidbit of wisdom right there. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Be careful who you are around. Wake up righteously and don't sin. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Notice, even Paul says, don't sin. A lot of people think that everybody sins all the time. It's like we all sin, so oh, well, we're just under grace. That is nonsense. Jesus commanded over and over again, go and sin no more. He said that over and over again. And here Paul says that. Don't sin. What is sin, you may ask? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is transgression of God's law. Sin is transgression of the law. What is God's law? Read the Bible. Read everything. Everything from Genesis to Revelation. Read it all. God's law. Anything that goes against any of that is sin. Don't sin, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, don't sin, guys, for some of you in Corinth that you should be believers, but you don't even know God. You have no knowledge of God whatsoever. I say this to your shame. Let everyone within the sound of my voice not fall into that category that we don't have the knowledge of God. You've got to reach out. You've got to pursue. You've got to chase after God. You have to seek him. And if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.